getting into our lesson because it's rather a long lesson, but we're going to split it up in at least two lessons, two sermons. We'll start today and Lord willing finish tonight. But we're going to look at the uh, topic of singing, singing as a matter of worship. Now, I hope that you know that uh, the reading that Troy gave us from Colossians chapter 3, starting with verse 12, going down through the 17th verse. Is that where I did? Yeah, 12 to 17. And if you notice, it starts off with things like love, tender mercies, the way that we treat one another, how we're supposed to treat those who are without, how we are supposed to live. Uh, verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. There are so many things that we're being taught about the Christian walk of life and how we are to present ourselves to God, to one another, and to the world. Yet, if we were to go out into the world and ask people their impression of the Church of Christ, what do you think that their first response would be? So many times we find out, oh, they're the people that don't use music. Well, that's wrong. We do have music. We have a cappella music in our worship, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But here's the key. What the Bible tells us the distinguishing mark of the church ought to be is love. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one to another. So how is it that if the biblical hallmark for the church is love, that so many people out there in the world see the only difference or the distinguishing difference of the church being the fact that we don't use instruments of music in worship? Well, for the most part, we've led them into that in so many ways. But we, we've tried to make that a distinguishing mark. We have emphasized that as the distinguishing mark. In some instances, people are told that they are wrong because they use instruments of music and worship, and we're right because we don't, but there's no connection there. There's no teaching that continues to say why one is right and the other is wrong. So in, in many ways, we have not done our work as we should and presenting the truth in love to others to try to get them to understand what we believe the Bible says about, or especially the New Testament says, about instruments of music in the worship. Now, if we want to talk about acapella music, and that's what, what people will say, and I remember that old Andy Griffith uh, episode where uh, they're, they're forming a choir, the, the community choir or whatever, and Barney <coughs> wants to be a part of it. Barney's criticizing some people, and one of the questions that Andy asked him, was, well, what is a cappella music? And, and he gives a wild definition there. So if, if we are to understand what we're talking about when we say a cappella music, that could clear up a lot of the uh, misunderstanding that people have. The word a cappella, really it's two words, a and cappella, but it's Italian and it means as in the church. It's the music that was in the church at the very beginning, at the time of the apostles. It was the music that was in the church for a thousand years. Years. Now in 670 A.D., uh, Vitalis, or I won't say Vitalis, maybe it's Vitalian, the, the Pope was given an organ and he tried to introduce it into the Roman church, but, but the monks who understood the scholarship of the scriptures, even at that late time, well, understood some of it, uh, just put up a fit. And it wasn't until after the year 1000, maybe 1000, that really instrumental music came into the churches. So uh, once we get that straightened out, 
and understand that the church does not use a cappella music. A cappella music is what the church used. That's why it's termed a cappella, because that was what was used in the church. So what I want to do today is just make the case for a cappella music as the only music that is authorized for the worship of the church. And when I say that it's authorized for the church, we know that Christ has all authority. He passed that authority on to the apostles, gave them the authority to write down what he said. The Holy Spirit was inspiring them to remember the things that he said. So what we have in the New Testament is what the Lord wants us to do. And let me say, first off, the what the New Testament says about music in the church is that we are to sing. Singing is specified in worship. Even, even before the establishment of the church. Go to Matthew chapter 26 and 30. Now, don't go there. But if you go there, you see that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, they sang the hymns and they went out to the Mount of Olives, and that's where Jesus prayed the Garden of Gethsemane. But even then, simply, they sang. You know, you can sing everywhere. You can sing praises to God anywhere. You can do it in your shower. You can do it in your living room. You can do it in the church building. You can do it out in the woods, out on the farm. What you can do that. You can't use instruments of music everywhere. But you can sing anywhere. And it shows that, that Jesus sang with his disciples. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. And you might want to jot these down just to catch them later. Philippian jailer, and he heard uh, Paul and Silas singing and praising God. Romans 15, 9, even from the Old Testament, it talks about singing and our singing being praised to God. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 15, we'll talk about that later. Ephesians 5, 19, Woo! we'll catch it later. Colossians 3.16 has already been mentioned to us. Hebrews 13.15. Uh, we'll offer up the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. And that's the words that we're using. That going back to the Colossian letter can teach and admonish one another and what God has to do. Of course, James 5.13, if there's any, uh, uh, if there are any who are and I forget the term, but I will say it's sad or uncomfortable, let them pray. If there are any who are joyful, let them sing praises to God. So there, there, there's singing is mentioned throughout the New Testament. Now, the only place in the New Testament where it really mentions uh, uh, instrumental music as worship, as worship is in the book of Revelation. But yet, the harpers harping their harps. We harp our harps all the time. We have a harp of two strings. It's right here. It's called our voice box. And when we're using that, we are praising God, hopefully. But that's what we are supposed to use in our worship. So we have all those things. Now, to be acceptable to God, to be acceptable to God, our worship must be, number one, in spirit. John 4.24, Jesus told the woman at the well that God is a spirit. Those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And that's the type of people, that's the type of worship that our God wants. So number one, it must be in spirit. 1 Corinthians 4.15, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding. Some people are singing songs that they don't know what those songs mean. They don't know what the words mean. They just sing it. Hey, that's a dangerous thing. And some people sing songs, well, they're in the worship and they don't even sing. How can that even be spiritual if they're not even singing? Well, I'm thinking about the words. But well, you know, there's an activity there. It's called singing. We're commanded to sing. But it has to be in the spirit. It has to be with understanding. And what is understanding? Well, it's simply the truth. We go back to John 4, 24. Worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, if we do that, it will be with grace. Colossians 3.16. 
if we sing, if we're worshiping God in our singing, if it's spirit and truth, then it comes from the grace of God because those are things that God gives us as a gift. It will be graceful in the sense that, and this is how strong the, the, the linguist who um, gives us the dictionary, tells us what those New Testament words mean, Old Testament words do for that book, the spiritual condition of one governed by the power of divine grace. If we're singing in spirit and in truth, divine grace is leading us. Divine grace is empowering us to do that. And that singing, that worship will be pleasing to God and it will be acceptable to God. Now, acceptable singing involves vocal activity. You cannot sing if you're not singing. If I'm sitting there listening to someone else sing, and that's what you have in a lot of man-made churches, they have a choir. And the choir sings, and you sit there and listen to it, and then after they're done, you say amen, or you clap, or whatever. But you're not worshiping. You're just sitting there. So it requires a... Uh, vocal activity. Now, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So it requires a vocal activity. It requires emotions. Where do our emotions come from? <coughs> Brothers and sisters, that's the spiritual part of us. That's the spiritual part of us. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember I've had sermons about how that we as human beings are made in the image of God. God loves, we love. God sees, we see. God hears, we hear. But when we have to talk about emotions, God loves, God grieves. It repented God that He made man. It grieved God. He had it. He was going to change His mind. He was angry. Who's the angriest person in the Bible? God. What's he angry about? Sin. All those emotions come from us because when God created man, he formed him out of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being in the image of God. We have emotions. That's, the spirit. That's a spiritual component in us. If we do not love, we don't know God. Because everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Yeah, that's our spiritual component. But there's also the mental part of it. And that's the understanding. Again, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. I will sing with the Spirit and with the understanding. I've got to know what we're talking about. Doesn't that come essentially from faith? Isn't faith more or less an intellectual pursuit. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It isn't what I wish, it's not what I hope, it's what I come to know and understand from reading the Word of God and believing the Word of God. That's faith. That's faith, especially when it's carried out in my life. But that needs to be in our singing so that it will be acceptable to God. Singing in worship is an act of praising God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. That's the whole point of worship, isn't it? Worship. And if you break the word down into the old English, it's worship. It is the worth that we place on God, that we're returning and saying, You are worthy, God. This is how much I value you. You know, a lot of people say that they believe in God and they trust in God, but they don't place a lot of worth on Him because when it's time to come to His assembly, you don't see them. <coughs> when it's time to, to obey Him, you don't see them obeying Him. When it's time to speak up for God, they, they remain silent. They don't place a whole lot of value on God. How much value do you place on God? That's going to be reflected in your worship, what, what, whatever. Uh, act of worship that is, whether it is the praying or the singing or in the Lord's Supper, in the giving, or whether it's even listening to Fred in one of his dry old sermons. Wow. 
what value are you placing on God? It is teaching and admonishing others. Colossians 3.16. Did you ever hear a song that you really like the words to it? I'm not just the beat of it. But I mean, you listen to the words. And, and, and every now and then I get a favorite song. And, and you know, I, I, I got a favorite song. It's not really a favorite song, but uh, every time I break into Sick of on a Chicken, my son Jeremy just said, Don't do that, Dad. Don't do that. And you have to listen to Sick of on a Chicken. You love it too. But there, there we have it. What are we teaching and admonishing others in our singing? Are we teaching something that we really believe? Are we admonishing, warning people about what's coming in our singing? That's the opportunity for each and every one of us to have an input into the evangelism that goes on within the group and the encouragement within the group. And that's the way the New Testament talks about it. <coughs> Singing in worship is making requests to God. When you sing, do you ever ask God a question in your singing? Why did my Savior come to earth? And to the humble go. Why choose a lowly bird? And then the answer <laughs> because he loved me so much. And he loves this. But yet we're asking, we're at, not only asking of God, but we're encouraging one another to ask those questions about life and death and eternity. Singing and worship is seeking. And expressing comfort, trust, hope, and encouragement. Did you ever sing Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. What's that about? Can you sing that and not mean it? Yeah, there are a lot of people. They just sing it. They don't mean it. They don't know what the words say because they're not doing it in spirit and truth. They got another reason for doing it. They might be trying to enter some people, or they just know that that's something you need to do. But do we know it? Do we understand it? Do we feel it? Is that a part of our being to help us to understand and then return value, worth, worship to God? All of those things must be in place. We must have a way to determine biblical authority if we're going to say that something is authorized or something's not authorized, okay? This is the dry portion, so if, if, if you're really going to lose me and go to sleep, it's probably in this portion, so yeah, pay real close attention now, okay? And once we get past this, this you're going to be okay, all right? Don't snooze on this one. How do we determine if something is authorized in the Scriptures? We hear so many things out here in the world. And, and you know, we were warned about it, weren't we? Try the spirits because there are many spirits that have gone out into the world. And many of those teach lies. Many of those teach deceptions. And some of them are just ignorant. Ignorant of God's Word. Ignorant of logic. How do you determine what somebody has said? You know, I, I pay a lot of attention and try to get you to pay a lot of attention to context. You know, three most important things in Bible study. Context, context, context. If you take it out of context, it's a pretext. It's a lie. And it's probably used to deceive somebody. So we always want to put things in context. But how can I tell when the... Bible tells me something, and especially for us, the New Testament, how can I tell when it tells me something that that's something that I need to do or not do? And there's a very simple process. You can use this in just about any area of life. Number one, is it a command? Is it a command? In other words, do you find in that passage, whatever you're reading, a command that says to do something or not do something? Jesus said, I command you to repent. 
Is that optional? Is repentance optional? Absolutely not. Each and every one of us, all men everywhere, Acts chapter 17, verse 30, must repent. It's a command. And when we're told not to do something, it's the same. It's, we don't do it. It's not optional. Not with a command. But there are two types of commands. There are generic commands and specific commands. I like to use the example of the, the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, specifically, we are to preach the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God, if you were listening last Sunday morning. Preach that to all the world. But we are to go. Now, how do I go? It doesn't tell me how to go. That's generic. Go however you can. Now, there are going to be some limits. Okay. And, and, and one of those things like that, you know, we might take out a full page ad in the Waxahachie Daily Light to talk about the gospel. I don't know how wise it would be to take out a full page ad in Playboy magazine. That might be going just a little bit too far. Yeah. Maybe necessary, maybe meaningful, we could probably rationalize, but uh, may not be effective. You see what I'm saying? We get to pick and choose the way that we are going to go. A congregation, as it gets together, whether it's under elders or the leadership of the men, needs to determine what are we going to do for evangelism. And then we need to do that. We need to work toward it. But we get a choice in those matters. The second thing is an example. Do we find an example? And some examples are binding and non-binding. You know, uh, well, how can you see what do you mean there are examples that are binding? Well, uh, we see what's going on in a particular place with a particular thing in the scriptures, and, and that, that example may be binding because it's expected for us to follow that example. Right. Now, the Lord's Supper. What we have is we have a command to partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. But then we go to the example of Jesus at the Last Supper and what he did, and the Apostle Paul reiterates that, reiterates it again. He gives it again in 1 Corinthians and says this is how the Lord did it. And, and we kind of get the idea that's how we need to do it also. We need to pray over the bread, pray or bless the fruit of the vine, and, and do it that way. So we follow that example. We, we know what's on the table. We know what should be on the table. So there are examples that are binding, examples that are not binding. Now the third is a little more difficult, and it's, it's called implication. And you've heard me talk about implication before. Some people call it inference. Listen, we infer things, but the scriptures imply them. Now again, we talked about the square. You know, if you've got a square and it's, and it's three inches on one side, uh, what are the measurements of the other side? Well, they're three inches because square says that's their equal sides, 90 degree angles within it. So, so there are things that we can understand that we can know just right from that. But what we have to do is be careful because there are, are some people that, uh, that want to use their inferences with things. Now, to give you an example, in Matthew chapter 22, verses 29 through 32, as Jesus is talking to uh, some of his critics, and uh, they're asking him, I believe, about the resurrection there, go back and check me. But anyway, he says, have you not read when uh, God appeared to Moses in the bush, the burning bush, he said, I am the God of Abraham, and Isaac and Jacob. He said, I am their God, not I was their God. God is not the God of the living, or the dead. He's the God of the living. That means Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive somewhere. Well, we don't understand they're alive in the Hadean realm, the spiritual realm, awaiting the day of judgment and the resurrection. Okay? But Jesus said, you should have known that simply by looking at the words, I 
Ham, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now we understand it, don't we? Could we draw that out? See, that's inferring where the Bible implies. But what we've got to do is be very careful that, that, that we don't infer where the Bible isn't uh, implying. And sometimes, listen, can I be... I'll give you a question, okay? There's a certain activity that, that, that a lot of people are going to say, well, that's sinful. That's sinful. That's sinful because that is destroying your body and you can't do something that will destroy your body. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Okay? Well, in context, what the Apostle Paul is talking about is fornication, sexual sin. But then we want to go off and infer that anything that harms the body we, is sinful if we do it. How many of you came here in a car this morning? Do you know how dangerous that is? You'd have been better off if you'd have flown here. How many of you go out and take walks? How many people die of walking? How many people don't wake up in the morning, they die in bed? You see where we go with, with uh, some of these things with inferences? And some people like to infer that, well, you know, in Ephesians it says that we are to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart, and that word song, see, that means to sing and play an instrument, pluck an instrument. So I infer from that that I can use an instrument to worship. Wait a minute. That's a noun. A song. Song, there is a noun. And the verb is speak, speaking, and singing. And speaking and singing are equal. Yeah. What do you do with the song? <coughs> sing. Now, if the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit wanted us to play an instrument at the same time, He could have readily put it in. Hey, play and sing that song. But He did. So we've got to be very careful about the implication or, I'm sorry, inferences that we draw and make sure that we're understanding what the scriptures say. All right, so, can instrumental music be justified by New Testament authority? That's just a question we're going to end up with this morning, okay? Number one, is it a command in the New Testament? Is there a scripture that says, you shall use a piano, a guitar, an organ, anything like that. A harmonica is all we want to say. No. There's no command. Not a single verse in the New Testament authorizes instruments of music in worship of the church. And most admit that one can easily worship without it. In fact, a lot of those places that have uh, instrumental music in their worship, they'll set the instruments aside every now and then and sing a song a cappella, and then they'll comment about how beautiful it is. I had a lady one time just she tried to ridicule me. How, how can you sing without instruments of music? And then a few weeks after she told me that, she sang the national anthem at a basketball, high school basketball game. I guess that wasn't worship, so that's all right. Where are we coming from? Okay. Number two, is there a New Testament example? Not one. And it's not until 670 A.D., Pope Vitalian, not Vitalis, the hairdresser, Vitalian tried to introduce it, and then it's not until A.D. 1060 thereabouts when it finally becomes sacred music part of the church. Uh, does the New Testament implicate its use? And again, the answer is no. Every place in Scripture where the New Testament church worship by singing, instruments are not found. And there's no implication.
education that, it, that, that they're, they're using? Is it scriptural? There's no such authority. First Peter chapter 4, verse 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If it were there, I'd have to tell you it was there. If it was there, I'd tell you it was there. And we'd be doing it. And you'd want to do it too, because you'd want to do what God says to do. It's not there. It's not there, you can't find it. Is its use justified as a good work? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for adoption, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that uh, the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished to every good work. Is it a good work? If the scripture doesn't mention it, if it's not commanded, if it's not there as an example, and if you can't see that it's implied there, it's not a good work. Not the good work that God would have us to do. <coughs> Logic demands that since the New Testament is the final authority for the worship and work of the church, and furnishes us unto every good work, and because it's not there, then we ought not to do it. God has always given specific instructions on things He wants us to do. And some things that's hard to understand, you know, like the fire. But uh, Nadab and Abihu in, in Leviticus 10, He said to get the, the fire in one place, and they got it from another place. Yeah, that's how specific He is. It was given to them. It was told them what to do. And finally, does it pertain to life and godliness? 2 Peter 1 3 says that we are to do all things that pertain to life and godliness. Nothing specified concerning instrumental music in our worship in the New Testament. But here's a key. Look at 2 John. 2 John, verse 9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son of God. And there's some that just want to make that, well, that, that's just whether Jesus is the Son of God or not. Uh, I think there's a whole lot more to that. It's what Christ has authorized. If He hasn't authorized it, uh, do you think He is pleased with it? If He hasn't authorized it, if we go ahead and do it, is He offended by it? And based upon that, the answer would probably be yes. So, the Lord did not authorize mechanical music for worship in the New Testament church. The apostles never sanctioned the use of instrumental music in worship. The New Testament writers never commanded them or gave examples of it or even implied. Well, the apostolic churches never used them. And even the man made churches, as they went into denominationalism, did not use them for nearly a thousand years. And I'll submit to you that any back to the Bible movement one of the first things that they will do is like, that's not in there. And we're not going to use it. Is it right and safe to say that acapella music was and is the only kind of music that is divinely authorized for the Christian church worship? Church? Yes. I believe so. Now tonight we're going to go a little further into that and uh, with a little more thought. But, but that's the basis of it. And the reason that we don't do it, there simply ain't no book for it. There ain't no book for it. We can't do it. The lesson is yours. If you're here this morning, subject to the invitation, whether it's repentance, baptism, tradition, sin, there's an every child of God desire to return to the fold, we ask you to come, take a seat here in front of us, and sing the invitation so much.